Welcome everyone to this Lines of Flight seminar hosted by the Research Centre for Performance Practices at the University of Huddersfield. Um, the Research Centre for Performance Practices, if this is your first visit, is uh, a research centre across the subject areas of music and drama and dance, um, with a particular interest in um, practice research and in interdisciplinary approaches to performance research. Um, before I introduce today's speaker, uh, I should say that we are going to be recording this seminar and the question and answers afterwards um, to make available on our YouTube channel. So if you would like your, um, your presence in the seminar to be, to be uh, removed, to be blurred out or cut out of the questions, please just let us know afterwards. Um, or indeed in the chat. In the chat afterwards, you'll be welcome to uh, ask questions either on your microphone or um, uh, by, by typing in the chat if, you're, if you prefer. Uh, for now, I will have muted everyone. Um, feel free to have your camera on or off during the presentation as you wish. Uh, and so it is my great pleasure to welcome our colleague, Dr. Nick Taylor, to give today's seminar. Um, Nick is Director of Teaching and Learning um, for the School of Music, Humanities and Media at the University of Huddersfield, where he researches and lectures on performance magic and creative technical theatre. Uh, he is the co-editor of the Journal of Performance Magic. He's worked as a performer, writer and director, and also as a research magician. And he coordinates the Magic Research Group and is currently undertaking taking a project on performing real magic, the conjurer and audience in Bizarre Magic. Um, he's also a member of the International Brotherhood of Magicians and the British Society of Mystery Entertainers. Um, and Nick today is going to be talking to us about hiding the elephant in the room. So I think without further ado, I'll pass over to Nick. Thank you very much. Hi, thank you. Um, I'm just going to now do that thing where I attempt to share my PowerPoint. So let's see if that works. Can is that OK? Is that on the screen? I see nods. Brilliant. Fantastic. Well, oh, OK, so many windows open. Right. I'm here. OK, um, firstly, thank you very much for inviting me to speak for the Lines of Flight seminar series. And and it's really interesting when Ben asked me to do this, really, because I'm speaking on an aspect of my work that I've never really expected to ever speak about, really. Um, the, it's the practice element of my research is something that has never really been explicitly outward facing. It's always been very fragmented. Um, it denies any neat methodology or any attempts to apply one. And there's no specific end point. There's no specific product. I'm excited and delighted to be talking about the work, but I'm equally apprehensive. In fact, when I was writing the script for tonight's presentation, I realized the act of writing it down was imposing a structure to something I'd like to have remained quite fragmented. And the structure felt imposed. Uh, this comes from an innate sense that this must be a significant output. And this was something I wasn't entirely comfortable with. So I chose to cut the text both with control C and with scissors. And this evening before the presentation, I've assigned numbers to each paragraph or section. Then I wrote a very simple piece of code to refragment what I had. I hope you will forgive the indulgence in this, but in summary, here is the structure of my presentation. Surprisingly, the code asked me to begin with a fragment about coding. In lockdown, being away from the studio, I took another direction. I wasn't sure if I was going to talk about this as practice, but I think it's useful because it's something that has been feeding into how I think of the creative process. With coding, I attempt to see if I can program the steps of my magic process and magic effects or tricks into Python functions. For example, this is an attempt, this is an effect using geomancy that I perform regularly. I'm looking at what happens when I translate that into code to the computer, or in this case, to a microcontroller. Can I then perform the steps of the trick and reconstruct or construct the actions in the code? The thinking here is different, and in turn, the method of the magic effect is reshaped into a logical process because you're faced with problems you don't normally have to solve. I hope to try this recoding of coding back in the physical space soon. I'm interested in whether the succinct or even complex workarounds we have to make when coding have an effect on what we do when we're back in the space. As a magician to code practice, um, the stuff that I'm working on is really fascinating. 
It also allows me to step away from a question of magical persona. That's a question that's been with me for a while when I've been working in the space. So it's nice to lose it for a moment in lockdown. For me, code strips of my identity, and I'm interested in coming back to it to find a performance identity, and this time based more on a beginner's mind. My notebooks range from ordered to a mess. There are tricks in them, but the aim isn't to be an inventor. And sometimes it's just a stream of consciousness, a stream of conscious nonsense, feelings and rants, and just generally stuff that I want to get out and onto the page. Some of it doesn't go anywhere. I know that's not terribly methodologically sound, but I want to catch everything. Notebooks help. Taking those notes and decoding them is very much part of reconstituting the practice into something. However, that something should not be a goal. Not having an endpoint to this is a luxury. A magician's relationship to bullshit is complicated as there is so much pretending you're something you're not. In the playground, we would say, you really think you're it. The act of being a magician is far more irresponsible than simply bullshitting. It's one of the reasons I don't normally talk about my practice or my journey into or through magic. It doesn't fit into the autobiographical or autobiography of the bullshitter. In the academy, talking about frac practice feels uncomfortable for me. So thank you for putting up with my bullshit this evening. I remembered a concluding remark in Frankfurt's on bullshit. Bullshit is unavoidable when other circumstances require someone to talk without knowing what he is talking about. Thus, the production of bullshit is stimulated whenever a person's obligations or opportunities to speak about some topic are more excessive than his knowledge of the facts that are relevant to that topic. Note to self, there are echoes of this in magic, and there may be echoes of this in the presentation. Why have I called this presentation Hiding the Elephant in the Room? I've taken part of this title from Steinmeier's book, Hiding the Elephant. The book charts a journey through the golden age of magic, beginning around 1862 with the earliest Pepper's Ghost Illusion, through to Houdini's performance of the Disappearing Elephant Trick in 1918. The Disappearing Elephant Trick was, according to Steinmeier and many contemporary critics, unimpressive. For me, the story that unfolds in the book ends in a low note. Steiner's coda to the story gives us the key. Magicians have an uneasy, debilitating relationship with secrets, which they know to be priceless and worthless at the same time. The actual devices, and Steinmeier here is talking about big box illusions, the actual devices might be simple and crude and only of value as tools for a larger goal. But you see, this pre presentation is about practice. It isn't about secrets. And so here's my version of the Steinmeier. With a bit of editing, it becomes, Nick has an uneasy, debilitating relationship with practice. He knows that practice is priceless and worthless at the same time. His actual practice might be simple and crude and only of value as a tool for a larger goal. And this evening, I'm going to present a deliberately fragmented approach to my thinking around this statement. Augusto Coeri, in an autobiography of, the, autobiography of the Hands on training in sleight of hand magic, takes an autobiographical approach to accounting his practice. He draws from Leroy's contention that perhaps bio, biographical narration in itself constitutes a mode of theorizing. Coeri maps his chronological journey through sleight of hand magic. He begins this process by writing his CV. The practice is traditionally linear, the journey is traditionally performative. The question for me was, does this linear approach fully capture the fragmented nature of my own journey through magic, which is far more pragmatic and fragmented and problematic? I tried writing a CV of magic. It didn't seem honest and missed out so much. Although honesty and missing out truth is pretty much a magician's thing to do, so I don't know why it bothered me so much. I believe my need to understand through practice doesn't just come from an engagement with the training in magic in a traditional sense. It comes from the fragmented nature of all we have become in our lives. My approach in the space, in practice, is frag fragmented through memory, a coming to terms. It is private. It is sometimes angry. It is sometimes lost. And quite often it's not ready to be seen. But does that matter? 
In a way, yes, as outwardly, externally, the performance of magic and the persona of the magician relies on performative writing rather than honesty. A CV that claims to set out magic training is itself a performance. A CV is a performance. It is a deception. When asked what I do, I reply, I'm a magician. I sometimes add, but not that type. There's a lot of reasons for this, but more of those later or before, depending on how this presentation gets fragmented and randomized. Quite a lot of my work is around something called bizarre magic, an easily dismissed genre, but I think an important one. It was a countercultural reaction against the glamour and glitz of magic in the 70s although it has foundations way back. It allows for a rediscovery of a whole bunch of darker and, if you like, real magic. Add some gothic, add some horror, and sprinkle liberally with storytelling and character. When I started exploring this genre, I discovered a community of thinkers quite different from other communities of magicians I'd been involved in. I also felt more comfortable with the themes, the ideas, and the people. I found this community supportive imaginative and interesting and friendly, less polarized than other communities of practice in performance magic, interested in talking through ideas. I think the allowance for that discourse is somewhat baked into the form of bizarre magic itself. The form you see isn't about method or finger flinging, it's about moments of story. We bizarre magicians are ultra nerds, kind of cool nerds, a bit, maybe a bit metal. Maybe we're even the rough boys, I don't know. What I do know is that persona, dramaturgy, storytelling, meaning were all aspects of magic I really wasn't used to exploring. Bizarre magic allowed me to do that. You see, I can't separate my journey through magic from growing up the way I did. Anger at being excluded, labeled, anger at privilege, anger at my physical body, and hours spent at nothing. But the swallowing of anger is quite the working class thing to do. This anger is suppressed. It has nowhere to go. When it does find an outlet, it's usually not healthy. Magic did not save me. At 15, a teacher took me aside for a chat. He says I wasn't like the other kids and had I thought about university. Obviously, I hadn't as I knew nothing about university or polys or anything like that. In fact, I genuinely thought there were only two universities in the country, Oxford and Cambridge. I had no idea what went on there although I suspected it was populated by men wearing large glasses and mainly beige suits. These places were not for people like me. It was institutionalized knowledge suspension. It was exclusion. Why am I telling you this? It's because these things provide a foundation to the continued working class chip I have on my shoulder. What did I have in common with the bourgeois magician and their right of center politics? I have to stop there, you see, because I'm starting to write performatively. I'm mashing up memories to make myself sound interesting. I want to reflect on my own discovery of magic, on my journey to a way of thinking, a way of thinking I'm happily unconvinced about. Choreography, curation and hosting. If you haven't already, read the stuff coming from Mark Hughes, his open letters from a PhD project really interesting. His journey through practice is fascinating. In his last letter, he stated, for me, there is always a tension between allowing yourself to see what emerges in free practice and working towards something, something that probably needs to be archived, performed, or referable. I haven't yet found myself in a place, in that place, as the referable material isn't directly, at least for now, rooted in my practice. Practice is something that might supplement some of my outputs, but it's a lot freer than that. And um, this has mainly come from me being unsure of the usefulness of practice of re as research. Taking another approach in the space, I would place myself in experiences I was never part of. Different situations or different imaginings, be they economic, learning or mentoring, all fictions. Some of this work eventually found its way into the article Out of Tricks through my practice exploring um, H.G. Wells's The Magic Shop. I called this part of my work, This Did Not Happen to Me. 
I was creating false autobiographies and putting myself inside of them, memories that were not my own. As a child, they're memories I wanted. As a child, creating my own fictional autobiography was a desire. As a magician, it is a necessity. I'm not sure I was or am comfortable with either. During lockdown, and partly as a consequence of not being in a studio, I started a series of photographs called Abandoned Magic. I wanted to get back in touch with my earliest journeys through magic. You see, when it comes to magic, I never throw anything away. This means I have boxes of stuff, treasure to magicians, crap to everyone else. Actually, it can be crap to magicians. Abandoned Magic are photographs that tell tales of magic that I've performed, used, um, or made when I was a kid. These photographs tell an autobiographical journey. The photograph here, the Joker and the Matchbox, or really a magic trick that allows me to change a playing card to a Matchbox, was something I made. I must have made it when I was about eight or nine. Um, probably from a, I probably saw it in a library book or something. The story it tells for me, I can see the house where we lived in. I can see the living room where I made the thing. The Matchbox itself is a wooden Matchbox. Um, probably used to light my dad's cigarettes. I might have even popped to the shop to get that those cigarettes and that matchbox. Though I don't know that for sure, as kids playing with matches and setting fire to stuff was a bit of a hobby for us in the 70s, so I could have got it from elsewhere. I don't think they make wooden matchboxes anymore, do they? The playing card that, made, that, made, that it's made from is really important. It's significant. It's a cheap pack of cards. It would have been the only pack of cards I had, and it would have been awful for trying to do magic with. When you look at magicians using bicycle cards these days, you wonder how I ever managed to work with this type of stuff. It's also made from the Joker, and that's really important. It just does tell me that this was only, that was only one pack of cards that I had. So to make the object, I needed a card that wouldn't affect the deck. And of course, the Joker could be easily sacrificed. So within these photographs of abandoned magic, I see loss. I see people, I see times, I see different energies. Before, during and after I'm in the space, I try not to map the practice. I try not to map before, during and after, but it is inevitable that I do. I'm interested in the accidents that occur in the space, but equally, I might see what happens when I endlessly repeat a card trick. What happens if I endlessly practice a difficult move? Repeat an action, how my body, how my hands respond, and the mess that's left at the end. Autobiographical. The work is and has to be autobiographical. So much of my practice is looking backwards. In fact, I've redacted most of this section as I'm not ready to talk about it. In the handbook of orthoethnography, the editors describe the process as complex and uncertain and encourage authors to embrace vulnerability with purpose. Sometimes I'm not quite sure I'm ready to share that element of me. Therefore, for this slide, I'm activating a mitigation of vulnerability. Midway in my last chunk of practice, I describe myself as being between the geomantic symbols Vea and Poplus. I come back to geomantic work regularly in my practice and indeed in my performances. Um, note that the interface with real magic is something I barely talk about, but it does form part of my practice. And a few years ago, it saw me undertake bardic training with the order of bards, druids and ovates. But here, populus represents stability, security and the status quo. It has to be fortified by the waxing moon. It moves forward towards the light. It is a safe place to be if you are allowed to be part of it, or even if you allow yourself to be part of it. Vaya is a rapid river running through this balance. Represented by the waning moon, it takes us into dark places. Full of energy, it represents an unstable path. It is a symbol of change. I find myself in Vaya often, and sometimes I don't like it. Magician Max Maven once said, a culture without magic or mystery would be insane. I think that as you explore magic, mystery, practice, truth, genuineness, honesty, and bullshit, you can become insane. 
I record everything that goes on in the space. I prompt myself, I watch it back, I make notes, I make more notes, including notes on me making notes, all of which will probably only be seen by me. I'm not making a video essay or a demonstration of practice or a performance to be seen by real people. These are essentially private moments. That's probably the best way to put it. As I'm writing this, I realize I don't know about the structure of this presentation at all. I haven't ever talked about my practice or what goes on. I write articles and chapters and practice can feel stolen or unjustified. For me, practice isn't a rehearsal. It isn't practicing a magic trick. There is no end point necessarily. It's fragmented, recorded, and notes are made. While there was no intention that the work leads anywhere, it inevitably does. It contains vulnerabilities. It is private. It contains truth. And there is little pace for truth in performance magic. I often find myself amidst the tension, deep rooted in working class anti-art sentiment. What good is practice is if it doesn't make anything? The bourgeois magician. The entertainer asks for a volunteer. The volunteer replies, fuck off, I'm not getting on stage. I've been at work all day, entertain me. Do I ask you to come down to where I work and polish my lathe? That was Ben Elton in 1985. There's a whole lot that can be discussed about Ben Elton and performance persona. But for now, that stayed with me. Growing up, it was class-based institutionalized exclusion. The deep-seated in-ground sensibility that we should get a proper job. The music lesson in school about how you should not rebel and start a band. Creativity breeds dissent. Today, politics is still deeply embedded in the magic community, but today I feel it is less about class and more to do with gender and race. Aladdin's 2008 article for performance research, Appearance, Reality and Truth in Magic, a personal memoir, gives us some first thoughts as to a magician live artist's relationship to their practice. He talks of a disproportionate emphasis on technique in magical commu magic communities, what it means not to be seen to fit in the continuums that are understood by the community with their reduction, quote, reductionist and exclusive view of magic. He states, it all makes it difficult to define and declare oneself a magician if one feels one's practice does not conform to these mainstream formulae and if one is aware of not sharing the same knowledge base. Some of my early work in the space was to do with endless practice. There is no goal. I'm interested in the process of practicing, the limitations, and also what I might discover through those. Magic makes demands on the hands and on the body that's perhaps unique to the practice. It also makes demands on the hand and the body that is separate to the genuine. My words, my mind is lying to you, but my body cannot. Fancy flourishes show there is a process. Does the magician have to show a process? Workshop notes, longing to be a diagram. Fear of magic, magicians, people who dislike magic. The puzzle fiends. Can these people understand kayfabe? Magicians who have no place for kayfabe. Magicians who are skeptics. Skeptics who have no place for kayfabe. Magicians who fear magic. Magicians who undermine their own performance, pat lies and poor humour. An outside world resistant to magic and need to turn towards an inner world. Make no claims to be magic, but make no claims not to be magic. Approach the work with an open mind, not the mind of magician. Beware the snake oil, the magician actor. Practice has been a lot of bit of challenge during lockdown. And at times I've headed to virtual spaces. Here I am in my living room practicing um, with a Oculus, to, Oculus Quest 2 headset on. Um, so I was gonna just play this video now if I can, there we go. So I'm interested in studio spaces that exist in VR space large black boxes I can walk around. And that's being able to help me map out my thought processes in a 3D virtual space. It's been very useful. Here, I'm using a 3D mind map. I can walk through ideas in the black box. I can make ideas pop in and out of existence. I can juggle them. I can push. 
I can pull them, I can explore, I can be amongst them much more than perhaps if I was working in, in the studio and then making notes afterwards. It's kind of a really interesting hybrid approach for me. Another way to use virtual space is to paint. In this case, again, I'm in a black box in a virtual space and I'm painting. Um, I'm tracking my hands and I'm tracking everything I do. In this one here, if I just play a little bit of it, this table here is actually a tracing of a real table. So this is my magic table that I perform at in the real space. I've traced it in virtual space. And so I can put things on it. I can perform. I know where it is in the virtual space. I won't bump into it. And what I've been doing is I've been tracking my hands. Um, in this case, this one here is from an early script I used to perform called How Psychic Are You? It allows me that um, it will draw it. It's drawn it quite fast. It's, it's sped up here. But I can actually see my movements in the space. Um, I can see where my hand was at any time, how I've used the space, where my hand is, where attention might be. If I'm honest, I'm not sure where this would go. It was just a very interesting experiment. And I think I'm producing some very interesting stuff that I might use eventually. And at this point, I knew I'd feel the pressure regarding free practice as research. So I thought it's better to demonstrate that there have been input outputs. Just in case I'm worried you're worried and the room is bugged. Here's a map. It's slightly out of date of how the work could be mapped or is, have been mapped to outputs. I feel a bit better now. So from this practice, I completed two articles which went into the Magiculum volumes one and two. The work is very much concerned with talking about my own practice, my own personal experience. The first one being about practice at the start of my exploration of bizarre magic, in particular talking about the shaping of a magic persona. The second one was a kind of extension of that talking, and it talked about the nitty gritty of persona. I found this, these works interesting and tricky to put together and because it was based on this fragmented free practice. Also, I didn't like the fact that I was making some of the practice concrete in written form, which is why even in those articles, I think they feel fragmented. And that's deliberate. And equally, it's found its way into this presentation. So I constantly find myself coming back to the genuineness of all of this, of finding a performance persona in magic, a practice in magic, and it's always been a challenge for me. The genuineness, genuineness of a magician is not like taking on a character, and it's not like you could be yourself either, no matter what some magic books might say. So by fragmenting this work in practice and tonight, I have indulged in performance writing. I don't think I've told any lies, but of course a magician would say that. I find that very disconcerting. Thank you for listening. And next time, I promise I'll do a card trick. There we go. Nick, thank you so much for that. That's absolutely fascinating. Um, I think we should start by a round of applause, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>